some people say that money makes the world go round. But you know what? I actually think it's materials that make the money go round. Because behind that money sits a commodity and a materiality that holds the value and makes the world go round. Ban Ki-moon, the former United Nations Secretary General, said, the era of consumption without consciousness is over. And he's right. We cannot keep doing what we're doing and we cannot keep consuming the way we're consuming. Our evolution has always been shaped by materials, whether it was the Stone Age, Iron Age, Bronze Age, and it was really positive, right? It really helped us out. But actually now materials are still affecting us, but they're not helping us. They're actually harming us, and most of us don't even know it. This is my beautiful son. So when he was little, I used to go into the toilets with him in the pram to change his nappy, and he used to scream and scratch at his cheeks until they bled. And it was because of the synthetic deodorizer that sprays every minute with synthetic fragrances, so it smells nice for us. And when I used to clean the floor, I used, to cleaning, I used a cleaning product that I thought was okay and safe, but he used to wake up from his sleep and not being able to breathe. And you know, childhood, you try and recreate for another. I used to give Play-Doh and textures to my son. But the colouring in the Play-Doh went through his skin and gave him internal pain. And small traces of food that I ate went through my breast milk into him and caused him to bleed and shed mucus from his bowel. So like every mum, I went looking for answers. I went to doctor after doctor. They thought it was dairy allergy, reflux, wheat. We tried all of these things, and some things worked, and some things actually made it worse, and no one really had an answer. One doctor even said to me, or at least inferred, that I had Munchausen by proxy, which means actually he thought I was deliberately making my son sick to get attention. So I had a responsibility to my son to keep going and to keep making him better, regardless if they thought I was making it up. Luckily, I'd been a nurse, and I understood science, symptoms, physiology and pathology. And eventually, I came across a wonderful immunological clinic, actually just down the road here, and met an awesome team that said, you know what, we don't know why this is happening, but we do know it's happening, and we know you're not the only one. Your son is not alone, and they're not just children, they're adults as well. And so we learned how to make it better and how to restrict it. Because what was actually happening is all these chemicals and materials full of molecules or actually proteins just keep invading us, all of us, every single day, and there's getting more and more of them. And our system's like, what's going on? We didn't used to have that many in our environment. And so these proteins are seen as antigens, and we create antibodies to the antigens, and our immune system just keeps fighting it. So you know what? My son just wasn't quite as good as fighting it as some of us. And slowly over time, he got better. But he's like the boy in the bubble, is what my sister used to call him, or the canary in the mine, or the barometer. Because actually what he was experiencing and what I was seeing it's actually what's affecting all of us, every single one of us. It just depends how good we are at fighting it. So what I learned was how to manage his environment, reduce the chemicals and keep it to a threshold so that he could manage. And as he grew, just a sheer size thing, the amount of antigens and foreign bodies that were attacking him per kilogram of his body mass just got less and his immune system matured. I learnt to buy better for my son and my family. And I'm here to tell you, because I want you to buy better, because I believe you deserve better. So how are materials affecting you and your family? Are you like the mother who came to me because two doors after installing her beautiful carpet, her son got rushed to hospital with an asthma attack because of the VOCs, volatile organic compounds, in the carpet? Do you guys know that they're in there? They're carcinogens. They cause cancer, and they slowly leak out into our air, into our homes. Or 
is that in hearing this talk that you now know that there's chemicals in the manufacturing of our foam that's in our pillows and our mattresses and our couch that we spend about a third of our life in inhaling. Did you know that? Or you know that new car smell that we get excited about when you get a new car? That too is VOCs, cancer-causing, and actually people have been sued over it from overseas. So what can we do different, and how are materials affecting you? I then took my step in responsibility a little further, and I thought, you know what, I'm buying better, but how is what I'm buying affecting elsewhere? What about the supply chains? What about even beyond Australia? And I discovered that other people's mothers and other people's sons were getting sick because of what I was buying, because of the things that I thought I needed here. I'll give you an example. I met a, a wonderful chair manufacturer who made his chairs offshore, um, and they were doing a factory tour, and they were introduced to the highest paid person in the factory. And the highest paid person was actually the powder coater. The powder coater is the person that sprays the painting on the metal, like on the chairs in the front here that they're sitting on. And the chair manufacturer is like, wow, this is great. He's making my chair. I'm just a little bit surprised why the powder coater is the person who's making the most money in the factory. And they said, well, that's because he only has five years to live. And he only had five years to live because of the amount of material and chemical he was inhaling in his lungs to make his chairs. And it was a privilege to have that job because he had a legacy of money to give his family after that five years. So the furniture manufacturer said, you know what, I don't want anyone only living for five years because of a chair that you're making for me that I'm going to take back to Australia and sell. And he shifted his whole factory and his whole business and worked with them to make sure that they were well. So I ask you, in terms of supply chains as well, what legacy and lives do you have in your homes that are not only affecting you, but others? And some people don't have a choice. Maybe that man did it because he wanted the money for his family. But there's also modern slavery, there's child labour, there's debt bondage. And you know what? <laughs> well, Australia's brought in reporting, which is fantastic. But if we actually knew how many people are helping support the lives, the privilege that we have to live, this is my number. I have a couple of kids, a couple of dogs, and this is how much it's estimated. And we can all go on a calculator and find out roughly how many people are slaved and harmed to give us the lifestyle we have. And once we know it, you can't unknow it. And once you know it, you want to do something about it. I also ask, are we arrogant enough to believe that it's just us as humans, as a species, that deserve not to be harmed, to have the stuff we have? And what about our animals? And what about our fish? Do you know there's two types of shower gels and soaps? There's one that's like foams a lot and is really clear, but it slowly kills the fish, the fish that we sometimes eat, by the way. And then there's this other type that's a little bit cloudy, doesn't foam quite so much, but it doesn't hurt the fish. The manufacturers don't want to make the one that's, you know, cloudy, because consumers complain and say, I don't want the one that's cloudy. But do we as a consumer actually know that the cloudy one doesn't kill the fish? Would we really care? When I was renovating my house, I rang up and I wanted to know from the stair maker where the wood was coming from. And they said, quote, end quote, why the hell would you want to know that? And I said, uh, well, because I want to know if it's forestry stewardship certified. I want to know if it's FSC. I want to know if it's safe. And because I don't want someone else's home destroyed to make my home. And they said, oh, no, it's probably fine. It's from Indonesia. I went, OK, well, actually, that's probably even more reason to ask, because there's lots of orangutan species dying out of Indonesia. And we got there in the end, and we found out it was ethically sourced. And maybe even. It's just the trees themselves that give us life as well. And did you know that Australia is still the highest deforestation country of any developed country in the world? And we clear 
more than Brazil, so we got all very carried away about the Amazon, but just note to self, we're still clearing more as a percentage of what we've got left. And how do we feel about that? So now for the good news. My son is actually in the audience, and um, he is strong and almost 14 and a fantastic human being. Even better, there are really easy, simple solutions on how we can all buy better and be conscious consumers and make the world a better place. And I'm proud enough to, to run and privileged to run Australia's independent eco-label. And I get to know and see that that eco-label, even though it might be simple, like a little tick or a label and look a bit boring, but actually it means that all the way through the life cycle of that product, from extraction of materials to manufacturing and chemicals, fair working wages and recycling, that it is a good choice for people and planet. And it's part of a global movement called the Global Ecolabeling Network, and there's countries, like loads of us around the world, driving and making these changes and making conscious consumption happen. And it does make it easier. It's often known as the circular economy label, because it is about circularity. It is about thinking about materiality in a whole different way. And it's called circular economy because, believe it or not, actually it makes good business and economic sense as well as for materials and for us and for planet. So it is happening. I like to talk about a place called Ecolabel Land, where it's really, really easy to live your life choosing ethical and conscious consumption products, otherwise known as Sweden. <laughs> yes, I know, damn, one day we're going to get it here as well. I know it. So in Sweden, Stockholm, I can fly in, I can catch a carbon-neutral, eco-labelled train into the city. I can stay in an eco-labelled hotel, sleep on an eco-labelled mattress, I can shower with eco-labelled, I can go out for dinner and dine at an eco-labelled restaurant, choose an eco-labelled bottle of wine, and then the next day, I can shop for eco-labelled fashion if I'd like. And you know what? If I lived there, I could actually choose to live in an eco-labelled house. So it is happening, and it's as simple as an eco-label. It could even be as simple as every single one of us buying eco-labelled toilet paper, or at least it's a start. So if everyone in Newtown moved from normal toilet paper to eco-labelled toilet paper, we would save 21 million kilograms of emissions every year, which is 73 filled, sweaty, Sydney cider buses of carbon emissions every year just by switching our toilet paper. So it doesn't have to be hard. It can be really simple. And I actually think there's an opportunity here to move from circularity to infinity and beyond. Because it's an opportunity of creativity and doing things differently together, because we care. And there's some great examples. So we can already buy flooring that's made out of recycled fishing nets that give villagers a new economy as their, the fish stocks die. And the broken fish nets that are in the ocean are actually broken and are killing fish anyway. So by getting them to take them out, they get money for them. They're recycled into a beautiful carpet. And then they can be reused and recycled after the end of that carpet. We're using waste products from our fly ash, from our coal, into pavers and bricks in, and into our roads. We can drink a beer that's made out of uh, old bread that would otherwise go to low, uh, landfill. And if you haven't seen it, beautiful mushroom leather and clothes made out of mushrooms that are the mushrooms that actually aren't good for our trees, so that we can actually grow them, make clothes, and one day maybe even compost them, and then we're ready to make a new outfit. So it can actually be fun, and I do believe we can create a movement where we're about regeneration, reusing, reducing, repurposing, refurbishing and recycling. And maybe it's even beyond consumption as well. You know, let's think about, do we really need the car or we just want to get from A to B? Do we really need that big meal or is it actually about nutrition and fuel for us to live this life? And how can we move that together? So it's as simple and it's already happening and there's solutions out there. And if we get stuck, there's a fantastic roadmap. 
biophilia. Nature is our best teacher. Nature knows how to do this. Nature has been doing this forever. There's no waste in nature, and everything has its purpose. Our indigenous peoples have done this for over 40,000 years and lived lightly in their legacy. In the Great Depression, I was lucky to grow up with grandparents old enough to learn a lot. When they had to do without, they could do without, and they were fine. And in India, there's even a word for it called jugad, frugal innovation. And it's about using what you have in front of you with creativity and beauty. And if you want more, there's this awesome global roadmap called the Sustainable Development Goals. And Australia has signed up to them, as well as almost every country in the world. And it is about setting goals and targets so that all of us actually can have a better place to live. And you know what? It's as simple as buying an eco-label product. You're already doing goal 12. And not only are you doing goal 12, but when you buy an eco-label product, you're also helping every single other one of these across the supply chain. And it's as simple as buying an eco-label product. So I ask us all, join me in caring and being a concerned global citizen for conscious consumption. How can we shift that together? How can we buy better? How can we move materials? How can we stand up for supply chains? Because you do have the power with each and every single purchase you make. And we will together make this place a better place for everyone. So I think the time is for us, for this generation, the next generation, to actually become the regeneration for our global community to make the world a better place. Thank you.